All right, all right, perfect. Hello, everybody. I'm Richard Medhurst. Joining me is a brilliant journalist, commentator, and comedian. He's also the host and head writer of Redacted Tonight and the author of podcasts uh, Government Secrets and Common Censored. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Lee Camp. How are you doing, Lee? Hey, thanks for having me on. You know, it occurred to me when uh, when I started, I wasn't called a journalist, but now luckily the standards of journalism have uh, decreased to such a level that now I'm called a journalist. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, seeing, uh, uh, don't be too modest, but you know, seeing what's happening <laughs> with TYT is, is definitely uh, this implosion. I mean, it's really interesting, right? They've kind of gone balls to the wall with their uh, doubling down on uh, the Russiagate and, uh, you know, uh, the 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 Duma stuff in Syria. I mean, to me, that what do you make of all that? Because to me, this is like the the Democrat version of anti-vaxxers and anti-science. You know, like no, the the attack happened. Don't listen to the scientists. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing. Like like many of us uh, got some level of our start either at TYT or or at least partnering with TYT. Uh, I I I was never an officially officially a part of the Young Turks, but when my YouTube show Moment of Clarity started to get successful, uh, I partnered with their comedy channel. They had a separate comedy channel. And uh, okay. and, and so we partnered through that and I it was a guest on there many on, on Young Turks many times, you know, and then obviously there's Jimmy Dore and Graham Elwood and, yeah. and so many others. But, you know, it at the time, it seemed like Young Turks was left of mainstream media, left of MSNBC. I mean, Cenk Uger famously got an MSNBC show and basically within two months was told either get in line behind Obama or get out of here. And he left. Uh, so, you know, he he took a stance against being MSNBC. And now it seems to me they are a YouTube version of MSNBC. Like it's, you know, support, yeah. jo support Joe Biden in the election, support Hillary Clinton in the election after <laughs> Bernie dropped out and, and, you know, do fawning interviews with Madeleine Albright and various war criminals and don't ask them any adversarial questions. And then on top of it, they've, they've recently jumped the shark to attacking those of us who actually are continuing to be adversarial to government propaganda yeah no absolutely I, f I think that's a perfect encapsulation but i mean just in your opinion opinion why do they do this do you think it's uh because you know a lot of people have correctly pointed to uh this large sum of money that they took from some uh, i don't know the background story behind this but they took like 20 million dollars from some pro clinton uh, uh group or something but you know to, to me I, I i think people give them too much credit you know i think because like if they took the money and said this stuff it would imply that they actually knew what's happening in syria and they're actually intelligent and then chose not to say the truth um <laughs> but i mean what do you think it is do you think it's like just corruption or what what, what is going on like what's the motivation behind that well i mean here's the thing it, it, various you know, various people take money from various places and it really depends on whether it's changing what they say. Uh, you know, right. I, I'm on RT, but when I agreed to take it, to create a show on RT called Redacted Tonight, my stipulation was, you know, I'm not changing who I am, what I talk about, what I stand for. And all of that, people can go back to all my videos before I was at RT. All of that has stayed exactly the same, except maybe I've gotten, you know, angrier in some ways. But uh, it's all stayed exactly the same. Whereas the Young Turks, there seems to be this clear line where they take the $20 million from Katzenberg, which is a, a big fundraiser for the Clinton campaign uh, and the Clinton machine. And all of a sudden things start to, to shift and they start to, you know, believe these uh, bullshit lines on Syria and white helmets and uh, Russia gate and uh, you know the Trump P tapes and all this stuff and and I guess you can point to where that when that money shift came uh, you know I, I don't quite know also you know one that used to right. be pivotal for me was uh, democracy now and I don't know what their money system is or what changed but uh, you know, they, I finally stopped watching. I, for a long time, I would still watch the first 10 minutes of Democracy Now. And then I finally stopped watching when every episode, the first 10 minutes had some quote from the White Helmets, which we now know is a, you know, it's, it was created oh, by a former MI6, you know, propaganda network. Yeah. Like it, 
it's so clearly propaganda and and yet they were just quoting it every single day yeah yeah that's that's terrible it's uh it, it's astonishing to me that you can have so much um you know just direct evidence uh these uh files uh, as you mentioned from the foreign and commonwealth office about the white helmets you can have the whistleblower emails from the opcw it, it's 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 hard evidence you know in the past journalists would would be you know, they'd be dying to get their hands on such a scoop and to talk about such a thing. And now say just they deny it, right? They 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 just act like it doesn't exist. And uh, I mean, I think you know this too. I'm sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, anyone who believes allegations about WMDs after 2003 is needs their their head checked. I think you know. But but nonetheless, we don't just have common sense. We have hardcore evidence, and they don't even trust it. And I think it's an excellent point you make, right? About um, when when the the change occurs, right? and uh, comparing with before and after. And so, yeah, I think that's very important. And um, I, was, uh, I was listening to your show um, the other day and you said something about like, uh, this is where uh, the introduction, you said something like um, <laughs> a news show in America by Americans where <laughs> Americans are called foreign agents. That's, that's, that's so, uh, it's, it's crazy, this Russiagate nonsense, it really is. Yeah, I, I, I do that at the beginning of every show now. <laughs> yeah. I started doing it when they, when the Trump administration demanded that RT register as Russian agents. I didn't have to, but the network did. And it, it was the first time a press outlet had ever had to register as a foreign agent because the whole point of that foreign agency thing was to uh, get people who are basically, you know, lobbyists and PACs and, uh, you know, just straight up uh, campaigning for a government, not a press outlet to right. register as such. And of course, you have the perfect example of that, like the quintessential dex dictionary definition of that is APAC. They are Israel's yeah. lobbying arm in America, and they don't have to register as foreign agents, but you have <laughs> a press outlet registering as foreign. I mean, it's absurd. And so then I started at the beginning of every show, I say, hey, this is the show where Americans in America covering American news are now called foreign agents to kind of remind people of how ridiculous and absurd this has all become. I mean, you know, we've been doing Redacted Tonight for seven years now, uh, had really great success with it. And I write all of my own stuff. No one ever tells me what to say. No one's ever told me to not to say something or to say something. And it's completely different from so many other networks. I mean, we know that where the talking points come from for MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, there's been countless stories in the past on these talking points, you know, Fox News telling their reporters, here's how we're covering things today. Uh, I don't do any of that. I'm, I'm writing my own yep. show. And yet, I'm somehow, you know, or our show or something is 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 uh, tarnished and attacked like this. Uh, you know, articles in the New York Times, NPR have all come after me, and it's just this crazy McCarthyism thing, which it, it, which is doubly funny because the Democrats used to be the party and the de and the somewhat more Democratic leaning media used to be the group that was like, let's not do McCarthyism again. Like they'd yell at the Bush administration, this is McCarthyist, and now they're just all in they're just let's just do mccarthyism all over again i love that right they've kind of swapped roles but then again when you when you see it as a one-party system it makes more sense but right. you know it, it, it it's it's true you know like i um uh when i got my uh my program so i started doing youtube first that's my main thing here we are right and then i got my program on on press tv and uh I recently with I started also the RT, so I guess that's, that makes us uh, Russian agent co-workers. But, you okay. know, that was also a, a clear stipulation like, yeah, I want to do and say what I like. I want to pick my own topics and do what I like. And and that's that's like the pillar of everything. And I mean, when you think about it, you, like we can dream of, of, of asking that at BBC or in MSNBC. They wow. would never give such a contract in the first place. It's absurd. And it, so I don't know. I think it's really astonishing. We have such a a backlog of links between uh, the national security state uh, in Britain also, right? This is not just an American thing and the media, right? So, and, and people still deny this and they think that, um, uh, you know, uh, state media only exists outside the West. This, this is such a hilarious concept to me. And, uh, you know, speaking of, of, of um, uh, these sources that they're citing, I mean, I saw Anna, she's like pointing to Bellingcat now, which is um, funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. I mean, wow. Wow, like what's next, right? What what is next? Yeah, I mean they Bellingcat has is so clearly a, you know, it's a US government or, or combined with British government creation and basically it allows 
uh, the mainstream media to not go, hey, we're quoting the CIA, which they do that too. <laughs> hey, we're quoting, they, they act like they take the CIA at their word. Uh, but Bellingcat was this kind of new thing where they could go, oh no, we're not, we're not going to the government. We're, we're getting from investigative source Bellingcat. But Open Bellingcat source, is, right? yeah, oh. has been just completely outed as just having a, a spider web of connections to uh, US and British governments. And, and so, yeah, to have uh, Anna from the Young Turks pointing to that is like, look, here's the proof that Aaron Mate is uh, funded by Syria or whatever the fuck she was saying is. Yeah. I mean, it's pathetic. Because, you know, Syria has so much money to go around during sanctions and a war, right? They have nothing, <laughs> they have nothing else to do except pay journalists. Uh, you know, <laughs> Lee, uh, speaking of, of your show, I wanted to, to ask you uh, about the uh, one of your more recent episodes. You talked about uh, what happened in Canada. You know, you have these, uh, I think it was 215 bodies of uh, indigenous children that were found in Canada and um, uh, who, who were in these uh, these uh, schools. And I, I just I was just hoping if you could maybe... Uh, walk us through the story, uh, explain it, because I don't think it's been covered enough, and I'm very grateful that you did and that you you came on here because I was hoping you could tell um, the audience here about about this this scandal, honestly, this this horrific uh, uh, thing that that unfolded. Yeah, I mean, so the the new the new update is is these 215 bodies, although I think they found 100 more, so it's probably more like 315. Uh, found in Canada in basically a mass grave outside of the uh, Kamloops residential school. So residential schools was this name that they gave to these schools where they would basically steal indigenous children and put them in these schools. And then the motto, both in Canada and in the US for these schools was kill the Indian, save the man. The idea was if we create cultural genocide, I mean, it was basically a stated policy of cultural genocide. They just didn't use that word, but to, to remove their name, cut their hair, uh, show them how to behave like uh, you know little British children or something, then, uh, that will, quote, solve the Indian question. And it didn't just go on in Canada, but that's where these latest bodies have been found. But uh, it went on in the United States as well. And so I covered that on Redacted at Night, that one of the most famous ones was the Carlisle Indust Indian Industrial School, they called it. And uh, it, it over the course of this time, in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, although uh, many of them went up to the 1970s, 75% uh, of native children were put in some form of this, some outside of reservations, some within reservations, but these boarding schools that were designed to create cultural genocide. And it, uh, you know, now there's finally some people talking about it, uh, you know, after these bodies were found, Trudeau had to uh, say something about it, but the action has basically been, you know, non-existent. His, his action was to put it to the top of his discussion list for his cabinet meeting, and that was about the end of it. Um, so there hasn't really been any uh, compensation. Uh, there, there also hasn't been even the return of these bodies to most of these native tribes that have been trying for decades and generations to try and find out what happened to their children. I mean, it's truly incredible. And to, you know, to speak to the larger point, because I think a lot of people want to go, wow, that's something really terrible that happened, uh, you know, pretty long time ago. So, oh, well, that sucks. Uh, but the truth is, this is what the American and Canadian, you know, North American empires are built on. They're built on the backs of so many peoples, almost exclusively non-white peoples, that were, you know, beaten and destroyed and enslaved and imprisoned, and and their resources, sometimes that was their labor, were stolen uh, from them. And that is what created this powerful and rich empire. And until we understand that, we can't evolve into something better and kinder and more generous and more humanity-based. I lost your audio. Uh, hold on, maybe, oh, I think it I should be it. okay now, right. Good. So I was, I was just saying that I, I thank you for breaking it down so succinctly. And also the last point you made where uh, you point out the, you know, the origins of uh, this British, uh, you know, settler colonial projects. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I remember uh, since I was a, a child reading about how they did the same things in Australia. Right. So yeah. It, it's yeah, it, it's really it's really uh, horrific. Uh, I think 
I think we can never really truly grasp the full extent of it because of so much so much of it is hidden also. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I wanted to ask you, so what has Trudeau done? What is the response of the Canadian government? I mean, just bringing it to the top of the discussion list, is that is that it? So they had in 2015, they put out a study, a government funded study on it. And basically, you know, thankfully, finally said the truth that it was a policy of cultural genocide that, you know, uh, hundreds, if not thousands were, were straight up killed and others just had their lives destroyed. Um, it, it basically told the truth. So that was step one to have that report come out. Uh, but step two of returning these bodies has not gone very fast. Uh, if at all. And they've also mentioned compensation here and there, but Trudeau, Trudeau and I think the Canadian government in general's response on compensation has been, oh, well, we want to do compensation, but it's tough because not every family was, uh, you know, injured equally. And I just love that idea. Like, you know, if we just had harmed them all the same, then we could have some compensation. But because, you know, some got hurt more, what are we going to do? I mean, no, it, 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 this is, I'm hallucinating. I feel like I'm hallucinating when you hear things like that. This is, this is crazy. And, and I mean, uh, one thing that, that, that I try to explain to people, and of, of course, you know, each story is different. Each, each uh, historical account is, is, uh, important in its own right but i do think you can draw some parallels between what you know is, there, is happening in palestine and what happened to uh the native populations colonized in in, in the americas and elsewhere because um you know a, a lot of the uh the the pr surrounding israel is to make it seem like it's a legitimate state like it's a country like any other while hiding their crimes uh that they actually come in in broad daylight right like they ethnic cleanse villages now with Sheikh Jarrah is just one example but do you, do you find that there are some parallels between the two yeah absolutely and you know the the reservation system in general has has been kind of similar without maybe the the walls and the fences but to uh put native americans in a certain area and then slowly find reasons or ways to uh to cut away at that amount of land and to uh intrude on it to steal the materials and the the uh you know resources from it to mm. steal the water from it to put pipelines through it uh all of that reeks of uh very similar to the palestinian situation um you know there are plenty of differences as well but Still, it's it's like you know we're okay. Yeah, we sorry we've we've uh, taken your land, a lot of your land, and destroyed a lot of your lives. But here's a piece of land uh, where you can you know have self determination and do your thing and you live your life. And then you know a, a week or a year later they go, well, okay, well we told you it was this much. How about this much? Well, actually we're gonna put a house here. So uh, we gotta put a highway through here. We gotta put a wall through here. It's it. I mean, they don't res actually respect any kind of like agreement on that front, you know. Yeah, because I, I, I was reading about those the um, uh, the pipelines. I think one of them is called the uh, the coastal. Uh, hold on, I'm getting I'm getting my pipelines mixed up over here. <laughs> yeah, one of them is the coastal gas link, and the other one I think is Trans Mountain. Um, I mean. You know, it's funny because I, I, Trudeau, he, he, he talks like he, he, he cares. He gives this, this impression like, oh, no, we care about the will of the uh, uh, indigenous. But then, you know, if there's a pipeline, well, I'm sorry, the pipeline's coming first, even during the pandemic, right? They'll continue funding these things. Um, you know, it, it, isn't it kind of messed up like how the native populations in Canada, uh, in, in the Native Americans in, in um, the United States, they're com like they're completely eliminated from any political discourse whatsoever. Like they don't even come up at, at all. Right. I mean, this this is astonishing to me. Um, yeah. And uh, what is it? Biden just put one in his cabinet, I believe, in, a native person. But oh, I think but I think it's pretty similar. You know, I haven't I haven't done a ton of research on it, but I think it's pretty similar to, you know, Kamala Harris being a black woman. It's like if you're willing to, uh, you know, put forward the exact same ideas as 
the ruling wealthy white male, uh, you know, people that have ruled our society for since the, the beginning of the United States, uh, if you're willing to say those exact same things, then we can put you in these positions. So right. just because someone identifies with something, you know, they are black or they're transgender or gay or whatnot, it, that, that's that's only a step forward if they have different ideas than the ruling status quo, quo, than the oligarchy. If you just put them in there and they go, hey, exact same shit that George W. Bush said, then what does yeah. it matter? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, you have to be a, a, a neoliberal uh, uh, at heart and or a neocon, of course, that, that goes without saying. But I, I, I was uh, talking about this with uh, with Glenn Greenwald the other day, and I said it's kind of funny, though, how even even despite all this like fake uh, uh, woke diversity that they try to do, you'll still never see an Arab in any cabinet in any position like that is that is one line too far. You know? right. uh, w what did you think of the new um, the new Israeli prime minister? Uh, you know, and what do you think of the fact simply that Netanyahu is out after 12 years? I mean, I think they're both great. I think uh, Netanyahu's <laughs> done a wonderful job. And I, I, you know, I wish this new guy a lot of luck. I'm sure he'll do continue a great, a great job. <laughs> no, of, of course, it's 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 pathetic and it's and it's borderline meaningless. Uh, you know, it's it's all the the, yeah. the same shit, although I guess he's more hardline on some things. He's very proud of having, you know, killed. Uh, many Arabs and things yeah. like that. Uh, so, you know, you're just replacing one disgusting with another disgusting. And, you know, that's what a lot of us have tried to say about about Biden and Trump and, you know, Obama and, and Bush is you're replacing one form of disgusting neoliberal uh, empire with another one. And the bombs are going to keep raining down and the systems aren't going to change. And Wall Street isn't going to to change their their exploitation and extraction of everything that matters in American mm. life. Uh, so it's it's it really is changing the outfit, you know. It's the rearranging the decks on the, the deck chairs on the Titanic, and and uh, it seems very similar to me in Israel. Yeah, yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. I think uh, uh, th this uh, idea that you know, oh well, uh, uh, Netanyahu is a little bit more to the left than him, or a little less hardline. Like what? There, right. There's you know, they're okay, but they're still just they're colonizers. I don't I don't really see how that changes anything for Palestinians. Um, uh, I, will, Lee, I was hoping. Yeah, I, go I ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. One, yeah, I will say one positive thing. I mean, the, the part of the reason I think Netanyahu just lost his seat was because this latest, uh, you know, attack by Israel, it they they really lost the propaganda war. And ah. that, that may be the first time in in these endless attacks against Palestinians that Israel has in the broader view of kind of the globally and in the United States and Britain lost that propaganda war. And I think that is a, a huge positive is that the, the, the propaganda system is cracking and it's been cracking for several you know years now. But I think we really saw the shift in this last attack. I mean, it it it's very commonplace now for people, uh, you know, in the United States, especially younger people to, you know, understand that Israel has at the least an apartheid state, if not committing genocide. Mm. So uh, it's, it, whereas, you know, you go back 10 or 20 years and it, people were afraid to say that. I mean, even, even CNN, what, what a, the last time 2014, they fired uh, Mark Lamont Hill because he, spoke out for Palestinians. They fired him as a contributor. And now you have CNN doing segments uh, where they're actually uh, talking about Israel's crimes. So it's it's been quite a leap. Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad you said that because I, I often uh, ponder about this. If it's, you know, if it's just me or, or uh, I mean, is do other people also get the sense that the discourse has changed around it? Uh, why do you think that is though? What, what do you think uh, sparked that or led to that? Um, do you think that maybe independent media had a role to play that in that? Uh, or what do you think it is? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, not to, not to be too grandiose, but it's you and me. Uh, it's, <laughs> Uh. It's, it, it's it's all of us out there who have been talking about these things, you know, uh, tirelessly uh, for many years. And although we will continue to be attacked and suppressed, uh, it it's a lot easier to get people to believe the truth and to believe the lies. And and it that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't get them to believe lies. You absolutely lies. You actually can. But it just takes a lot more work. So. 
so even though we may have a far smaller reach than say the mainstream media uh, and stuff like that, it is changing these dynamics rather quickly. I mean, uh, you know, the, the changes on views on climate change have, have completely shifted over the past 10 years. The, the views on, on uh, you know, environmental destruction as a whole, views on uh, LGBT rights, uh, views on legalizing marijuana. So many of these things have had just a, phenomenally quick shift if you really look over the scope of history. I mean, even just United States history, so a few hundred years. Uh, this is a blink of an eye for all of those shifts to happen. And I think that despite all of the suppression, and, and I am suppressed into the <laughs> 12 feet into the earth. I mean, you know, my, my Facebook page, which used to be very large, uh, 330,000 has been basically shadow capped at that number for the past five years. So it's, you know, I, I, I was... I was talking about suppression and, and being a victim of it long before it became like the common thing to talk about. But despite all of that, these ideas are still, they're, they're getting for, they're getting around and they're growing. And it's because you, you just can't, it's very difficult to hide the hide reality from everybody for, for too long, you know? You're muted again. I think, uh, it there should be okay now. I'm switching back. Yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, what are some uh, some issues where you would like to see the discourse uh, uh, evolve? I mean, what are some things that are just you know um, not moving along too fast at the very least, or something that's that's just you know uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be mainstream media, even in ind independent media. Are there topics where you would like to see the discourse completely shift? Oh God, yeah. How long do you have? I got a three hundred and thirty-seven. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> topics. I'm gonna pull up. Uh, but to go to go at some of the deeper ones, I mean, there there are there are many kind of there's a there's a combination of third rails and just stuff people don't want to talk about. It might not be a third rail, but they they just don't. It it bores people and things like that. But one of the biggest ones is like electoral politics should be like ten percent of our discussions. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it matters. And I've done so much coverage on making our votes count and how to have an actual legitimate voting system in the United States and how our elections are rigged. I've done plenty of coverages, coverage on that. But it's like, you know, a large Princeton study showed that when the American people want something, they it happens 0% of the time unless it aligns with corporate interests. So if that's the case, if we understand that and that's the case, then why spend all of our time talking about electoral politics? It is a, in many ways, it's a smokescreen and the, the, the real changes and the real governance of our world is happening behind closed doors. And so I'm not saying don't talk about it, but it should be like 10% of our discussions. Instead, it's probably 80 or 90% of our discussions. And, you know, even, even for me, if I do a video about AOC, which I don't that often, but if I do, that'll get 10 times the number of views because that's what people want to talk about. But it's, you know, we're never going to create this change if we just spend all of our time focused on electoral politics. It's uh, between two parties that are the same party. I mean, that's most of the bickering still goes back to those two parties. And uh, it's just, it, it, it drives me nuts, but, but there's many other issues, uh, you know, that I've tried to cover that are kind of third rails, talking about prison abolition, talking about, uh, you know, I talk about getting rid of 99% of our police or really revamping all of our police system because it's all founded on uh, white supremacy and protecting the the status quo, the system of, of oligarchs exploiting a tiny, a, a large number of people for a tiny number of profit, tiny number of people to profit. Um, so yeah, that's that's a few of them, but you know the list goes on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that's uh, that's really good. And you, know, I, I have I have two follow up questions. I, I I'd say, uh, you know, uh, when you hear speaking of electoral politics, like, uh, what do you think of um, when Western media start uh, going off about how you know Bolivia's elections are are rigged, Syria's elections are rigged, Venezuela's elections are rigged, and. Uh, you know about the police. I mean, is there is there a model or a specific country which you would like to see, uh, uh, impl you know, uh, um, emulated in the West or, or in the United States that would be much better uh, than the current one? 
So in terms of the first question, uh, yeah, I mean, it's always ridiculous when they call out other countries because of their elections. First of all, because we don't have legit elections uh, in any way. Uh, the biggest way that they're rigged is simply by making us vote between two fraud parties that are both uh, hardcore capitalist, kill your neighbor to get a couple of dollars parties. And, uh, you know, they're both the war state. They're both the, the, the Wall Street state. So, uh, so that's the biggest way it's rigged. But there's mm. a bunch of other smaller ways, which I've gotten into in the past. Um, and so for us to call out other countries as like their legit elections aren't legit is hilarious because ours are probably less legitimate than theirs. We're one of the only countries that almost every vote is cast on electronic voting machines that can easily be uh, defrauded. So uh, yeah, it's, and then the other thing is that we only point to, our government only points to countries that we want to create a coup against as ha not having legit elections. Uh, any country that has, you know, either our, our puppet government in control or has a, you know, right wing borderline fascist government in control, then we never point to those and say, oh, those elections didn't count. Uh, we only point to like, you know, socialist countries or countries we're trying to destroy as not having legitimate elections. Uh, and then the other question in terms of uh, police model and, you know, I, I don't act like it could be done overnight. But so you have you have kind of half steps, which, which would be, let's say, you know, policing in some of these countries where they aren't killing everybody. So like Sweden and Germany and uh, Switzerland and Denmark, you know, German police average something like three murders a year, whereas the United States average over three a day. Uh, you know, we're killing our police are killing over a thousand people a year and in Germany, it's like three to seven. In Denmark and uh, and Switzerland, the past couple of years they've had, uh, or, or several of the past years, they had zero deaths, meaning they literally let every one of their citizens live. How horrifying. <laughs> uh, so there are much better ways to do this where police are actually in charge of, uh, you know, like, de like decreasing conflict instead of creating conflict. Right. Our cops are trained, you go in there and anyone could kill you at any minute, so just kill them first. Uh, that's what our cops are trained. Over there, it's all about de-escalation and about you know actually getting, it's not all about that. I don't wanna act like police in other countries are wonderful, but there is more, there, there is more, uh, more you know, highlighting of uh, de-escalation and things like that. But obviously the end goal would be to get even beyond that where you have much more community policing, community uh, understanding with people, and probably have a shifting police force where, you know, and you wouldn't just give it to people you don't know. So it's not, people are like, well, what about the, uh, dr the drug kingpin is going to become the cops? And it's like, no, it would be a com co the community knows the people, understands who they are. And then you'd have a shifting and places have done this before, uh, you, uh, you know, you have a shifting police force. So, OK, you guys are the community, uh, you know, security for a certain period of time. And then it shifts. And in that way, you don't have a group of people always as the as the enforcement of kind of like a fascist state. You don't have the same group. They know that it's going to shift to another group soon. So you can't yeah. treat everyone like shit because it'll come back to get you if you were to do that so it'd be a shifting you know community uh policing situation and most of the most of the times that our police in the united states are in inserting themselves into situations it's often either ridiculous you know dumb laws like no loitering or whatever or it's people with mental health issues some say upwards of 50 percent of everyone they murder is has mental health issues like police shouldn't even be called when somebody is having a mental health you know he's peeing in a public fountain well there should be and some cities are doing this a number you call that sends mental health professionals that are not running around with guns I mean, right. there, there's so many steps to take, but the, these ideas are out there. It's not like I'm creating these ideas. It's just our mainstream media specifically will never talk about the fact that these ideas are out there. Well, Lee, uh, uh, just uh, just as a last question um, before I let you go, because uh, uh, 
you know, you, you, you tweeted about uh, Julian Assange's father. I think he's doing, uh, is it, he's doing a U.S. tour right now. Is that it? Uh, could you, yeah. do, you, do you know more about that? Because, you know, I'm, I, I spoke with him briefly in London when I was covering the, um, the, uh, the hearing. Uh, I didn't know that he's in the U.S. right now. He's doing a tour there. Is that it? Yeah, Assange's uh, brother and father have been uh, touring around and appearing on panels. And today, I think it might be over at this point, but today they're in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I heard they're coming back to D.C. I don't know all the details, but uh, if people go to my Twitter, at Lee Camp, and scroll down to that post, uh, it links to people who know more. So, All right, that, that's wonderful. And speaking of your Twitter, where can people find more of your work and uh, follow all the brilliant stuff you're doing? Thanks, man. Yeah. The, so the TV show is called Redacted Tonight, but it's also all online as well. And it's uh, the easiest place to go is just my website, leecamp.com, L-E-E-C-A-M-P.com. There's plenty of other links, but uh, it's easiest to just go there rather than reel them all off. So yeah, I'm, I'm Lee Camp on Twitter as well. And my other show, the YouTube show is called Moment of Clarity. All right. Wonderful. I've, pu I've pulled it up on the screen so people can see right here, leecamp.com. Lee Camp. It's, it's been great talking with you. Thanks so much for coming on the program, and I hope we, we get to have you on again. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Take care.